days, I'm on the fence about what poltergeist activity really is. When I wrote this book, There's Something Under the Bed, many years ago now, I believed with most parapsychologists that poltergeist activity comes from a human living agent and not from ghosts or demons. Today, uh, I've changed my thoughts about that, and I believe that poltergeist activity can be present in a variety of different paranormal or supernatural circumstances. The case of Tina Rush is an interesting one indeed. In fact, it's one of the most tragic stories in the annals of parapsychology. I wish I knew more about what led up to the eruption of events at Tina Rush's home in Columbus, Ohio. The investigating scientist, parapsychologist, William Roll, who's now deceased, was very scientific-minded, and as far as I know, he never asked Tina if she had been involved in occult activities prior to the events, such as using a Ouija board and other things that uh, preteen and uh, adolescent girls almost always do. I know I did, and I was, I think, about the same age as she when these uh, uh, phenomena began at her home. At any rate, I want to share with you the story of Tina Rush from my book, There is Something Under the Bed, and maybe you can decide what you think this activity was. Chapter 8, The Power of the Poltergeist In his essay, Ghosts and Liminality, parapsychologist George Hansen observed of liminal or transitional experiences, quote, liminal phenomena are typically transient, ephemeral, and have an affinity for chaos, transition, and instability. They are also usually viewed as slightly disreputable. Author's notes, these are all things that are described um, of demonic activity as well. (laughs) Certainly, this definition perfectly fits one of the most controversial and disturbing case bodies in parapsychology, that of poltergeist phenomena. Indeed, the definition suits even more perfectly the typical poltergeist agent, In a poltergeist case, the agent is the individual, usually an adolescent, around whom the paranormal activity seems to revolve. The activity is typically of an intensely physical variety. Poltergeists were long believed, and still are by many, to be the spirits of the dead, or demonic spirits. The word is the German word for noisy ghost, and poltergeist infestations are marked by doors opening and closing, unexplained knocks, disembodied voices, and sourceless music, the movement and teleportation of objects, and family members, especially the agent, being pushed out of bed or down the stairs, having their hair pulled, and being punched, kicked, or bitten. Commonly and unfortunately, the poltergeist agent, though first seemingly innocent, resorts to the fraudulent production of the phenomena in order to please spectators, draw attention, or prove the activity is genuine. As a result, incredible controversy has almost always accompanied these enigmatic manifestations. In 1984, Tina Resch was a 14-year-old former foster child living in the Columbus, Ohio home of adoptive parents who were increasingly troubled by her rebellious behavior. That year, inexplicable phenomena began in the home that in short time attracted the attention of local news media and later the scrutiny of arguably the world's most knowledgeable researcher of poltergeist activity, William Roll. Tina Rush was left at the hospital by her mother just 10 months after birth. The next day, she was placed in foster care, where her future parents had cared for more than 250 children in the past. Attending primary school, Tina found herself constantly in trouble, charged with throwing pencils and erasers and otherwise disrupting classes. Later, her mother would recall that no one, students or teachers, ever actually saw Tina touching those objects, and so some wonder if her alleged telekinetic abilities had manifested at a much younger age than first thought. The disturbances in school, deliberate or not, isolated Tina from her classmates. She was diagnosed as 
hyperactive, and much show was made by teachers of administering her medication during class each day. Eventually, peer ridicule grew to violence when Tina's classmates literally tied her up on the playground, taunting her as she cried. Tina was removed from school, and her parents hired a tutor to school her. In between study sessions, Tina helped care for the numerous foster children in the Rush home, a situation that she actually seemed to enjoy. But one day, the Rush's world turned upside down again, this time far worse. From the first day, the unusual physical activity in the home was full throttle, beginning with electrical and numerous malfunctions of the lights, microwave oven, kitchen clock, and television, and leading to extremely bizarre and inexplicable manifestations, including one incident where eggs stored in the Rush's refrigerator shot through the closed refrigerator door, breaking on the kitchen floor. Media focus on this apparently large-scale case of what parapsychologists call recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, or RSPK, resulted in the capture of a number of infamous photographs believed by many to be truly paranormal. In particular, photojournalist Fred Shannon of the Columbus Dispatch snapped a shot of Tina sitting in an armchair with a telephone handset and its coiled cable propelling itself across her body from the phone cradle on the side table. This now infamous flying phone photo has been published countless times by proponents and skeptics alike. However, the photo and the testimonies of social worker, Tina's foster parents, and the photographer himself were undermined by later events, namely... As the case progressed and attention swelled, Tina was caught faking phenomenon, giving the explanation that she was tired and simply wanted everyone to go home and leave her alone. Parapsychologist Dr. William Roll visited the Rush home in March of 1994, having been informed of the case by the Rhine Research Center, the academic descendant of Duke University's original parapsychology laboratory. The Columbus Dispatch had contacted the center after Fred Shannon's story and photos ran, and Roll later admitted that when he agreed to visit the Rush home, he expected to find nothing more than a teenager craving attention. What that first visit led to instead was an eight-year investigation of Tina Rush by Roll, who went on to pen an entire book on the case, Unleashed, published in 2004, 20 years after the start of the events. Roll also analyzed the case for the popular paranormal magazine Fortean Times, recalling the steps he had taken to diagnose Tina's troubles and arrive at a workable theory about what lay at the heart of the incredible phenomena. To establish or eliminate the possibility that Tina suffered complex partial seizures, he said, I suggested to the Rushes that they take her to a neurologist. They did so before my arrival with a follow-up in May. John Corrigan reported that her brainwave record showed no epileptic spikes, but the tests demonstrated occasional muscle jerks, blinking, twisting, and incessant finger movements. The results of Tina's neurological examination were analyzed extensively, it was suggested that Tina may have suffered from a mild form of Tourette's syndrome. Dr. Roll said that Tina had an urge to express herself that she could not suppress. At home, with her mother, this often caused her to be loud and brought on demands for quiet, which released in turn torrents of loud and foul language. This would lead her mother to slap her on the face, or when Tina became too big for her parents to handle, a beating from her foster father. Verbal explosions and at least one physical attack on her mother were her ways of dealing with being rebuffed, said Dr. Roll. Tina's urge to express herself even in the face of punishment was consistent with the diagnosis and was one of the pieces of the puzzle of the so-called RSBK. Dr. Roll said he also discovered other signs that there might be an anomaly in Tina's brainstem, associated with day and night functions and the parasympathetic system. 
When Tina had her third neurological exam in May of 1984, she mentioned frequent aches at the back of her head during the day and also described persistent coldness and spells of daydreaming. In 1992, Tina Rush, now Tina Rush Boyer, had become a divorced mother of a three-year-old girl named Amber. That year, Tina was jailed, along with her boyfriend, David Heron, for the murder of Tina's baby daughter. The chain of events leading up to Amber's death began when Tina was only 16. According to reports, Tina's parents decided to sell their home in 1986 due to the disfavor of neighbors after their daughter's publicity. They apparently informed Tina that she would have to find somewhere else to live, that she would not be welcome to live in their new home with them. Tina was still a minor, and she faced the choice of either marrying her boyfriend or living in a juvenile detention center. She disappeared and announced that she and her boyfriend had eloped. Though this wasn't true, the couple did later marry, but her husband became abusive and Tina divorced him. She later became pregnant by an anonymous father. For the baby's well-being, Tina married boyfriend Larry Boyer, who also beat her, eventually into unconsciousness. After divorcing Boyer, Tina went to live with William Roll and his wife and seemed ready to turn her life around. She began nursing and computer courses, and sometime later met a man named David Heron. At the time of the toddler's death, Tina was at the home of a friend who was helping Tina to write an account of the mysterious events of her earlier life. Heron was the only one in the home with the child. It was later discovered that Amber had been sodomized. Tina passed a polygraph test with flying colors. Nevertheless, she was jailed and awaited trial for two and a half years. In October of 1994, Tina accepted a plea bargain to avoid the possibility of capital punishment. She was sentenced to life plus 20 years in prison. Her boyfriend received 20 years for cruelty to children with the possibility of parole. Tina had spoken many times with Roll about feeling incapable of expressing her feelings even in the face of turmoil or abuse. When she would speak her mind or become upset, she was reportedly severely beaten by her adopted father or by her boyfriends. She was also allegedly molested by her brother. Tina's best friend died in a car accident at the age of 14, a loss that she kept inside, expressing little grief at the time. Is it possible that Tina's unsettled psychological makeup, diagnosed early on as hyperactivity and later as Tourette's syndrome, led to the many difficult and eventually tragic circumstances of her life? Is it also possible that Tina's plea bargain came about because she was used to being disbelieved regarding her actions, just as she had been from her earliest days at school? Is it possible, rather, that all of the known doorways to the demonic in Tina's earlier life, broken family, abuse, molestation, mental illness, had led something far worse to enter her life and destroy it. Though first believed to be the result of fun-loving or highly active spirits, poltergeist activity has survived the scrutiny of many modern scientists who have come to believe that the phenomena are real, but decidedly unspirited. In the laboratory, Attempts to recreate the dramatic effects of poltergeist cases have failed. However, experts are convinced this is because the phenomena only occur within the complex dynamic of the family situation, something also true of most demonic infestations and possessions. Undaunted by the skeptics who cry fraud in the face of the often bizarre cases that continue to come to light, parapsychologists like the late William Roll continue to labor to convince science that the power of the mind, or perhaps something else, can be a truly dangerous and physical thing, leaving in its wake physical and familial havoc, lasting emotional trauma, and in at least one case, even death.